Hello and welcome to Sentences, a writing podcast. And for this webinar, a sequel to our previous webinar, we do a deep dive into reading, which is an important skill in writing. And we talk about reading comprehension. And we are fortunate enough to have as co-host Amber Lamprecht, a nationally renowned education specialist and literacy expert who talks about her experience and gives us tips on how to help kids with reading comprehension. We also have high school junior Maya Bolyut who gives us practical tips on how to comprehend texts more easily. Enjoy! Hello, hello, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our webinar. We are super excited, and um, it seems like we have a great group today, and uh, we just wanted to thank you for um, coming to our webinar. So this is going to be an interactive webinar. Feel free to turn on your camera. Feel free to ask questions while we're presenting our content. And if you wish, you could also type in your questions in the chat. We will have a portion at the end of the webinar to answer questions. Um, so if you think of something and you don't want to forget it, you can just type it in the chat and we will get to it um, at the end of the webinar. But before, since we're all here, um, hopefully more participants zoom in. Uh, but I think I think we can get started. Amber, you think yes. so? Sounds awesome. Great. Okay, so welcome. My name is Chino Baliut, and I run Sentence Center, a virtual writing school whose mission is to help kids become strong and confident writers. And today we are going to talk about reading comprehension. So although we're a writing school, I get a lot of questions about reading comprehension, how to help kids understand what they're reading, because reading and writing are, are, are so interconnected. And uh, we are super fortunate to have Amber today, um, Miss Amber, who's going to, uh, who's a literary specialist. And actually, I'll have you introduce yourself. Um, but she's an expert. She um, she's national nationally renowned, and um, we're, we're super fortunate to have her today. Hi, everyone. My name is Amber Lamprecht, and. Um, I have been working in literacy instruction for 23 years and have uh, really been working towards um, helping a lot of people reach uh, their goals um, in clinical ways, in classroom methodology. Um, I have a master's from Berkeley in uh, pedagogy of teaching. Um, and a lot of the things I'm going to be talking about today uh, encompass that and uh, different practices I've tried both clinically in practice and also in the classroom, because I believe a lot of these ideas need to be in classrooms, um, but they are not being taught by um, teacher prep programs. And um, so that's me. Um, I ran the Literacy and Language Center in San Francisco for 13 years and um, now I'm working on a national level, um, giving advice for districts across the nation who are trying to step up their reading proficiency rates. Um, and then Chino, you know, who's an amazing uh, educator in our area. Um, Chino, do you want to introduce yourself a little bit? Yeah, sure. Thanks. So as I mentioned, I run Sentence Center and we are a virtual writing school and um, we hold weekly writing classes and we help kids um, become strong and confident writers. And I, I recognize some of your names, some of your kids are in our classes um, at this moment. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's just our mission to help everyone become better writers. And one way to do this is to make them better readers, which is why we love to talk about um, this topic um, as well as talk about writing. Absolutely. Okay. So I want to start by having you try something in your mind. Um, this can uh, help us understand what I'm going to be kind of talking about. So in your mind right now, I'm going to say a word. I want you to make a picture of it. And the word is tree. So make a picture of a tree like you're coloring it on a piece of paper. So think about what that would look like. You can actually color it if it's easier to do that. And if you're doing it mentally, think about the shapes that you would use, the colors, 
um, put a background in there, make it detailed, um, think about how you would describe it in words. And I'm actually going to have people give me a couple things in the chat. Go ahead and put in a couple things that came to mind. Some descriptive words, colors, shapes. Um, did you think of more of like a Christmas tree? Did you think of um, more of like a broccoli shape? Did you have an apple tree in mind? Um, let's check out what you have in the chat. A school mascot, yeah. Chino was telling me he, he was picturing uh, Dartmouth's logo, which was kind of more like a pine tree. Is that right, Chino? Oak tree with a thick brown trunk. Awesome. So that's actually more of what I was picturing too, was sort of broccoli shaped. Um, so that's matching a little bit of mine. Um, Angela says a tall green and bushy shape with a cloudy background. Oh, nice. And she mentioned her background too. Excellent. So we're making pictures of trees. Um, but I'm noticing like comparing a tall bushy tree to the kind of like the school mascot that uh, Chino has, they're two different shapes, right? So when we make uh, pictures in our minds like that, um, we it's number one, an exercise in something called uh, concept imagery. But think about it this way. If you told your child, I'm going to pick you up by the tree after school but you didn't tell them what kind of tree. And so you were thinking the tall piney tree um, that's shaped like a triangle, like Chino had in mind, but your child was thinking about the um, tall green bushy shaped tree that Angela was thinking about that could cause a little bit of a problem, right? So language is associated to uh, imagery. And so what we, what we imagine in our minds actually really matters if it's different from one another if it's different um it can cause problems in communication but that's the basis of a lot of what we're going to be talking about in terms of reading comprehension so i'm going to come back to that idea here i go back into sh uh sharing my screen okay so i'm going to start talking um with my uh piece of this conversation about reading instruction because a lot of reading comprehension is rooted in how we teach child the children how to le to read so how students are taught to read impacts their comprehension skills and this is becoming a national conversation which is how do we teach kids to read in the best way well actually there's an answer to that so there's a sequence that is necessary to teaching reading instruction, and not everybody's uh, adhering to this. And a lot of the Bay Area schools that I've worked in um, have not necessarily had these parts to it. So these are things to be aware of and ask your school and your teachers if they're really kind of working through this progression of, and um, they're hitting all of these things. So the first thing on here is the alphabetic principle. The alphabetic principle is basically that letters make a sound and um, that by building language, we put these symbols, these odd looking symbols that equate to words that then equate to um, a sequenced sound in a word. So um, that we start with the alphabet, but we also have to understand phonemes. So phonemes, um, understanding what all the vowels are from the beginning, not just the basic ones, but being able to put together um, sort of like a puzzle, um, being able to sound things out piece by piece. So, and that goes into phonological processing and rhyming, wordplay, being able to um, play with words, say, if I've got the word cat, what are three words that rhyme with it? Um, so being able to have the word families be a part of that, but also if I take the first sound off of cat, what do I have left? So being able to do that in the beginning reading stages is really important. That blends into phonemic awareness, which is the ability to discern the uh, identity, the sequence, and the number, the uh, amount of sounds in a word. So count, sound counting, things like that comes in, blending and segmenting words. So when you start getting into two consonants um, together, 
and being able to spell. So a lot of schools are not teaching spelling enough. And uh, Chino and I've talked about that because when you're writing, you see a lot of that. Um, so uh, spelling is really goes back into this type of uh, sequenced reading instruction. And that also plays into word recognition, which is where words aren't spelled uh, with the common reading rules because uh, our language is based on uh, a lot of other languages. And so we borrow from those, the reading rules from other languages. And sometimes our language just doesn't play fair, as I like to say. And all of those things stack up to something called reading fluency. Reading, reading fluency is the basis of reading comprehension. So we're gonna talk about reading fluency for a minute. Why is reading fluency so important? Well, in elementary school, we're working towards getting reading fluency to the point where we can get to reading comprehension. The two kind of go hand in hand. So reading fluency is the combination of reading accurately, meaning without too many mistakes, and then with a, a decent speed. So the speed in which um, one can read, and then that opens up the process for reading comprehension. I like to uh, sort of think of it as two different processes that are happening at the same time. Um, the first one is reading, reading the words, reading them fast enough so that we can have this extra room in the brain to add the second process, which is making a movie in your head of what you're reading. So you can't do that second process if you're still trying to sound out words or you're trying to recognize words. So elementary school is building that fluency base up, especially in those kindergarten through third grade years where it's really imperative that they're getting the, the nuts and bolts of reading. So reading fluency is, is the first goal and then getting into reading comprehension, that's where we want it to be very fluid and the meaning making part is the most important. So when we don't have fluency that's working super well and that's gonna impact our comprehension, we're gonna see things like this. There's going to be students that are uh, sounding out too many words, and that's going to slow down the comprehension. Um, if they don't know enough sight words, that's going to kind of impede the comprehension. If reading levels aren't the right exact place for them in that moment, if they're reading something that's a little too hard for them, then that's going to be really hard for them to understand. Font size issues is a really interesting thing that's starting to become a more and more um, big issue after distance learning, because we all learned, um, as I taught, you know, public school online, um, we all learned online and the students' eyesight changed because they were reading text um, in a different surface. And the surface we read changes the muscle structure behind the eye. And so font sizes are really becoming um, um, something that matters more. So um, when we read in a book, we have to do this type of action, and then we switch over and do this type of action. And that's very different from being on a computer screen. And so on a computer screen, often the font is bigger. It's um, having our eyes do less work. And so when a student goes to the page, their eyes have a hard time adjusting. And so this can cause problems with shifting into chapter books or when the font size gets smaller than what a uh, student's eyes are used to. And so um, that's, that can be show up as um, a comprehension issue. So there's a lot of new things that are de developing that we're just starting to see that is, uh, that is becoming a problem. Um, but that can show up as a comprehension issue. Um, challenges with something we call prosody which is sort of the phrasing in which we read. So when someone reads like a robot, if we've all heard that the cat ran, the cat ran very fast, um, that's an indication that someone's not really understanding the meaning of words too. We have to have that language have a flow to it like speech. Um, and that's what we call prosody. Um, so that's a little bit of a warning. If someone's not um, reading with that phrasing, that often means they're not um interpreting it with that phrasing as well. And then if they're not engaging what we call concept imagery, which is they can ask questions and have a conversation about what their movie had in them. So let's talk about concept imagery because that's really the bulk of what I wanna talk about today. 
So concept imagery is the ability to make a moving picture of what someone both reads or hears that can be re remembered more efficiently in the brain. So our brains are really not good at remembering names and phone numbers and <laughs> things like that, um, symbols, um, but we're really good. At, our brains are structured to remember uh pictures and memories and um, different uh, images. And so we have to convert language into an image. And that's what concept imagery is. And so that is a process we don't teach in school. We don't talk about it enough. And so teachers have to sort of implant that structure and that process in if they know what that is. And most teachers don't really think about this enough. There are talks um, in teacher training about making an imagery as a source, but it's not a training per se. So what we're going to be talking about is skills that you can talk about with your child. If you are a teacher, because I know some teachers are in the audience, these are things that you can talk about in your classroom to really kind of embed these ideas in. And that can be enough to just kind of have these conversations repeatedly in the practice of reading with children that really make this um, something that works for them. So there are four ways that we show that we know things. So it's we are talking about reading comprehension, but, but um, our comprehension skills are not limited just to reading. So the same idea of concept imagery that applies to listening skills. So I don't know if how many people um, have seen that if they have if a student has a hard time understanding what they read, they might also have a hard time holding directions that they've heard you say. And if you found yourself as a parent repeating directions over and over and over and you're thinking, I know I just said that four times. Why isn't it sticking? I mean, that happens to the average person. <laughs> but um, if it's not a a will, uh, <laughs> an ability, it, this is more of an ability type of thing. If you know that your child heard you, but they're still not, um, they're really not grasping it and retaining it, um, then this can be something where they're not picturing it in their head. And you can say, I want you to picture what I'm asking you to do picture these things, and that can help them kind of ground it into a checklist. So, and that also can work for uh, verbal skills. A lot of students that I've worked with that have comprehension issues, if you ask them how their day was at the end of the day, hey, how was your day? They kind of give a word salad, um, like, um, you know, recess was good, and, and maybe, you know, little bits of words come out, but not full, full descriptions. Um, Sometimes the words don't fit into a sentence structure, um, and that obviously then impacts the words in, in writing formats. So if they have a hard time filling an idea, or describing something in full, extending an idea, that's often because they're not um, visualizing what the idea is that they're really trying to engage in. And that picture-making process, if they can hold on to it and remember or remember the details of a book that they read and the sequence of the things in that book to write a book report, then they can anchor that idea and write from it. And it really makes all the assignments that they have to do much easier. So concept imagery is sort of the key to all of this. And it is a skill that you have to develop. So here are some symptoms of weak concept imagery. Um, having a hard time making connections, um, such as inferences and predictions, um, because that's the analysis of understanding the basic level of having to kind of work off of that. Um, having a fast reader, but they're not understanding. So that's an imbalance in that system where they can read fast, but this comprehension level is not meeting that same speed. We have to kind of get them to raise that same process level for their understanding. Um, they have a hard time holding on the details. And so taking tests and book reports, things like that, the application of information is really hard because when they get to the test, it's like blank page. Oh my gosh, I can't remember anything I read. Um, and so that's um, where the efficiency of how we store information 
gets really anchored in imagery that helps us to remember later. And so this works for test taking. It works for many things. Um, having to reread uh, sections or a whole, if there's a comfort level with a book, I just want to read this one book over and over and over. And Charles may be a little bit older to be doing that. That can be because there's a comfort level there. Um, but also if as an adult, after I get off of work, I am sometimes so tired that I reread sections because my brain isn't picturing. And that's what's happening is I'm not making a connection with what I'm reading. And so that's the same thing that happens with children when they're reading. If they're reading the same section and they're not getting it, it's that they're not making a picture. And so our brain wants that picture before we go forward. We really need to anchor down what we just read before we can go on. Um, if your child finds reading boring, I mean, a lot of kids do, um, if they prefer graphic novels and I'm not digging on graphic novels, I love them so much, but think about the level of language in a graphic novel. They're not having to read as much text and they're also not having to extrapolate inferences and predictions from anything but pictures. So the pictures are provided. The concept imagery is given to them in a picture-based format, instead of the reader having to make them for themselves. So that makes the, the two-part process, it's a one-part process. So that's why graphic novels are a lot easier comics. They're a lot easier because it sort of puts the perspective of reading in a one-step process. But when we have text and we have to make the pictures, it is requiring us to do a lot more work in our brains cognitively. So when we say, when a child says that it's boring, they're actually saying it's too much work for my brain, which, you know what, we can understand that a little bit more if we're understanding that. So making that jump into chapter books for students is often, that can be part of it. And also the, the, the text shrinking. Chapter books have smaller text. So those two issues can come up around third grade when the text starts to get a little bit more complicated. And then main ideas, oh my goodness, they, everybody wants a main idea or, you know, to be able to formulate, what's this all about? Give me a summary. Um, can you tell me one sentence that um, describes all of what you've read? If they are not able to do this, that means they're not tracking what they're reading. And that really keeps the, uh, the concept of imagery, keeps the process intact so that they can then work off of that for the analysis, which is the main idea, being able to do that. So here are some strategies. Let's talk how we work through this. How do we build concept imagery when we're not in a classroom or when we are in a classroom, but just by kind of having a conversation about it? So when you're reading with a child, you want to explain to them before you read with them, okay? What's, the, what's this idea? So I want you to make movies when you're reading so that you're explaining this to them. It's, and you can talk about your own pictures if you're comfortable with that. I often do. Um, I'll tell them, I like to read books so much that I like to do it more than movies, going to the movies, because I get to be the director, I can choose the actors and the costumes and the settings, and it makes me um, have more control over the story. So I think it's better than watching a movie. And so if you explain it in these ways, sometimes the kids will go, wow, that sounds really great. I think I'll try it. Um, so read together, but kind of start them off with the idea. And then it's going to take time. Sometimes we practice with the nouns. Sometimes we just say, well, what are three things that you need in your picture? And if you're reading Frog and Toad classics, um, I need Frog, Toad, and a bike. Um, and so you can just kind of go through the list and get it started that way. Um, or you can do things like a lot of students are, naturally do this. Um, they already are picturing. You can check and have a conversation with your kiddo. Um, say after a section, so what did you picture there? and see what kinds of answers and descriptions come up. Um, but if they don't know, you can also model this. Here's what I pictured. I pictured, it's really interesting, frog and toad in the pictures looks like this, but my picture is a little different because um, I don't picture animals wearing clothing. So I don't picture the frog and the toad wearing clothing, but I do picture them on the bike. 
So understanding that the book's illustrations don't have to match the words, you can have a different um, idea. Um, so ideally their answers, um, when you get those summaries from them pretty regularly, because that's how you're checking in to see how they're doing, this should be sequenced with the plot, um, not backwards to forwards, but forwards to backwards. If they do that, then you just start, hey, tell me back, back when this started, go from that point when we started that section, just give them a cue and say, from there on, what happened? Um, ask them what the characters look like. And even if the characters aren't described, a lot of kids tell me, well, they don't describe the characters. And you say, well, you know, um, you know, with some books, they don't, you're right. Um, so, but we need to come up with something uh, because the other character is going to interact with them. Um, but uh, setting and place um, are really important. So the background, where is the story taking place? Um, that's actually crucial for making the critical thinking questions like main idea and um, predictions and uh, assumptions take place. Um, what do the things look like? So ask those types of questions. Um, and more questions to ask, you know, what do you think is gonna happen next? So before you turn the page, you can either say, what's gonna be on the illustration? If we turn the page, are we gonna see Frog and Toe baking cookies together? What do you think? Um, and then you can say, oh my gosh, we'd guessed it right. Or you can say, um, let's read the text and see if your guess, you know, match. It becomes a guessing game every time you turn the page to them. And that, you know, makes it fun. You're, you're modeling the fun of reading. Um, um, always when you're reading with somebody, let them finish the sentence. Don't jump in. It's kind of a habit we get used to of, oh, check this word right here. Let them finish the sentence. It's really hard to kind of stop and let yourself do it. Um, but let them do that and see if their correction process steps in. If they keep reading forward, go, wait a second. Did that picture make sense to you? Because you're going to want to aim for the, the comprehension as the guiding point. So did that picture make sense? We'll check the word that didn't match. So you're going from the picture to the word then. And that's really embedding that the comprehension process is what's guiding the whole thing, because that's you know really what you want to anchor it towards. So, and then if they come up with a different answer and you say, wow, that part made my picture look different. Did it change yours? Um, or if something changes and you can kind of make that comment as you're reading. So for older students, uh, for middle and high school levels, um, I'm going to let uh, Chino take over here. Okay. So now Amber discussed the younger kids and I, my job is to talk more about the older kids, uh, middle and high school students. Uh, when, and you know, when, when it comes to reading comprehension, most of the questions, at least that I get as a teacher um, and in our classes involve somewhat of testing. So some parents, I mean, if you're a parent of a middle school or even an elementary schooler, um, you'll, you, I'm, I'm sure state testing is very familiar to you. If you're applying to private schools, it's those um, standardized tests. If you're applying to colleges, it's the SAT and the ACT. Um, so we, uh, the, the, the lens with which I will talk about strategies have something to do, have a, have a slant towards testing and how to help kids get through that big reading comprehension test. So the first thing that I always recommend is that kids recognize patterns, um, because especially for nonfiction writing, which is what kids will be seeing a lot in standardized tests, there is a pattern. And this is a pattern that we teach in our writing classes. So we teach the multi-paragraph essay format. And in that format, we teach kids how to write an introduction, body paragraphs, and a conclusion. And within the introduction, we always say that they always have to start with their thesis. So to those of you who have kids in, in my class, in, in Mr. David's class, you can ask them what a thesis is. They will tell you, or they should be able to. So your thesis is your main idea. And if you're talking about reading comprehension, um, test question, I, about 90%, I would say even about 95% of all reading comprehension test questions will ask the main idea. So if your child can locate it, in a text, just by looking at the format, 
they're going to have a big advantage. So, for example, um, we, um, you know, we, like I said, we, we teach essay writing and um, we always tell them to put the thesis in the introduction. So, if, Amber, if you could please um, show one of uh, an example of an essay. Um, and we're, we're just going to shift screens a little bit here. So the way we teach writing is we show essay models. So we discuss an essay model. Most of uh, most of our essays or all of our essays are nonfiction. And here's a, a, an informative model. So um, nonfiction, we teach kids how to write your outline, your thesis, and your three points, and to create an introduction. So this is about pickleball. I wrote this. Um, um, it, I, I, I don't know if anyone here is into pickleball. It, it's the fad now. It's the craze. And I try to explain why it's so popular. Now, if kids are writing in the format, the multi-paragraph format, they write an intro and the last sentence of your intro usually contains your thesis. So with that, if they're reading a text and they have to answer a main idea question, I always point, you know, look at the intro. Look at the last sentence of the intro. Most writers will put their point right there. So that's going to be a, a, a huge advantage for kids looking for the main idea. Now, if they're looking for um, the main ideas of each individual paragraphs, I tell them to look at your topic sentences because a good writer will always start with a sentence that signals to his reader, this is what I'm going to talk about. So for example, this first body paragraph is about pickleball being easy. Okay. It's there. It's right there in your topic sentence. And then following, uh, following the topic sentences are your details. Okay. This is what happened. Here's my example. Here's my evidence and all that. The next paragraph, it's the same thing. Okay. You need uh, equipment is easy to obtain. The, the, it's it's there in the topic sentence and the third body paragraph it's there as well so where do kids have to look introduction usually at the end for the main idea topic sentences are key and this is why we always teach our kids to write topic sentences and again in your conclusion the paragraph that wraps everything up you will have your thesis embedded there restated differently from what you had in your introduction so if your if your child can identify first of all if your child can write like this they should be able to identify these patterns when they're um, when they're you know faced with a reading comprehension question or reading comprehension test okay so that's the first part of that's one strategy another strategy involves okay and involves uh, making connections so. Um, to those who, you know, have to read a book. So let's say your child has to read a text, a, um, a novel. Let's just use To Kill a Mockingbird because that's my favorite novel when I was teaching. Um, for some uh, kids who haven't been to the South, who weren't born in the 1920s, it's hard for them to connect to a text like this. So two things I usually do. I usually bring it in the classroom. When I used to teach middle school, I used to bring this into the classroom. I would encourage lightly them for them to look up summaries or analysis online. So we're now at an age where it's so easy to find resources, pull resources for a certain book. So, you know, summaries, let's say a chapter that they were stumped with or even Shakespeare, um, they can always look online for help, okay? However, this I always tell them this doesn't replace the actual reading. Read the text first and then get help, okay? It's not the reverse. Don't read the summary and and, and not read the text. Um, because first, first of all, it won't make sense because the analysis needs the actual text. One thing also I, I do with kids is um, I let them watch the movie, and uh, for a text like To Kill a Mockingbird, for example, I used to bring in the black and white classic movie with Gregory Peck. And at first, as a teacher, I thought, oh, my kids are going to get bored with this movie. It's, you know, it, it was made in the 60s, 70s. And like I said, it's black and white. The kids loved it. Oh, my gosh. So I, I would, you know, I'd, I'd assign a chapter, you know, chapter 17, um, read about, you know, they're, they're reading about the trial scene with Atticus Finch and Tom Robinson, 
And then the next day, the kids would would come up to me and say, are we going to watch a movie? Are we going to see it in action? And, you know, we would see that scene. So it was like they'd read the the, the text. Um, some of them had questions about the text. And then when it would come alive on the big screen, wow, they would, it, it would just make so many connections for them. So um, that's one thing that you can do also. If kids are struggling with a certain text and you know of outside resources to help them maybe it's a movie maybe it's a tv show maybe it's a, a an episode on netflix maybe it's a a documentary that will support that text you know that's one way to to help them comprehend what they're reading it's not so much like explaining what the book is about but you know making connection and, and have having them figure it out for themselves you know may may i just step in and just uh, compliment what you're saying and saying that what he's suggesting is is uh, in teaching methodology we call it establishing prior knowledge because um, students don't have the the breadth of knowledge and experience and lived experiences that we have um, often we need to provide a little bit of a, a stopgap and using visuals is really great um, to be able to do that. So this is, is uh, very helpful to be able to kind of show different background situations um, or give more of a kind of a little bit more background on something so that they can kind of grasp the full meaning of things. So um, fully support this. Thank you. Okay. So for the next, uh, for my next tip for the middle schoolers, um, one thing that one, one, one gripe, one complaint I get a lot from kids is that, oh, something is very, is too boring. Something is hard to read. And I ask my, my daughter, who is a, a junior in high school, and hopefully you'll be seeing her in a few seconds. And um, she, she gave these two very practical suggestions. Um, one thing is to, you know, build stamina. So um, reading, like any other skill, has to be um, has to be built in time. So a lot of practice, a lot of reps um, are needed. So you know, I a lot of parents ask me, you know, what can I do to, for my kids to to improve writing at home? So the first thing I would say is, of course, write. Try to write as often as you can. Write every day if you can. The same goes for reading. That's why your teachers always have you, you uh, always you know give you the you know read 10 minutes a day read 20 minutes a day until it's 30 40 so i always give that you know i always give that advice you know read 30 minutes a day and make that your minimum so kids in elementary school can easily read 30 minutes a day if the, you see that they're comfortable with 30 minutes up it to 45 up it to an hour so this stamina this muscle as it 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 strengthens, um, your kids could you know be um, stronger readers and develop the patience um, that they need as well. Because for the most part, um, one of the one of the complaints I get from older kids, because I've helped kids um, prepare for the SATs as well. And one of the biggest complaints is, oh my gosh, that reading comprehension, the reading section, those, those passages were so boring. I fell asleep after reading two paragraphs. You know, it's a, it, it was a, a section about botany and 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 um, or any other scientific, very technical pieces. You know, I I I read about sleep apnea, so they um, they they lose interest right away. And um, the best way to do this is just you know just hang in there, just stick with it, and have patience. And um, like I said, the only way to do that is through multiple reps. So um, one one thing also that you know my my daughter was was saying is that um, for kids who read text and initially don't understand it, so maybe they would um, you know they would they would they would get you know, the first part, as they, as, as the story becomes more complex, they, they start losing it um, in, in terms of comprehension. One thing is just, just stick with it. Just stay there and it will eventually unfold. Okay. So, uh, so that's for my, um, 
for my uh, and for my previous slide. And this slide is is it's just a bonus step tip for test taking. So one thing that that kids can do, and one thing that I recommend, is um, if you're taking a test and you get to the reading section, you'll usually read a couple of paragraphs and you'll have three, four, five questions about that section. One thing, one tip is read or preview the questions first. Preview the questions first. So this way you're telling your brain or your your um your your um training your your mind, okay, I will need to find the main idea. I will need to find a detail in line 17. I will need to find an author connection and all that. So once you have those objectives, you are you you should be able to um, you should be able to sort of zero in on what you need. And um, as you're reading, things will be so much easier. So um, that's just my my tip for today. Um, some teachers don't like to do it, but I you know it's it, it's something that I recommend. Other strategies are first um, be keen. And, and uh, I, I use this slide because one of the questions I got from your signups is how to make things more fun. So here, here are ways to make things more fun. First is be keen on student interests. Give them books that they love. Okay. Um, and that way they'll build that stamina and patience because they're always going to be reading it. If they like Minecraft, buy them books on Minecraft. If they like sports, buy them Sports Illustrated. Get them a subscription to the magazine. So be keen on their interests. Tap into other formats such as audiobooks and ebooks. So this is one thing that I didn't realize. My daughter is actually the one who, um, who, who told me that a, a lot of Kids now are on ebooks. They they read on their laptops. It's easier to obtain. You don't have to go to the bookstore or the library to get these books. Um, it's easy. Audiobooks also, if your child's an auditory reader, you know, pop in a CD of Harry Potter as you drive to LA. Um, for, for my kids, that's how they love, that's how they got into the series. Watch movies. I, I talked a little bit about that early on. Make personal connections. When I say personal connections here, you know, if you're reading a book as a family, as a family, um, you could say, oh, wow, you know, journey of this character is similar to our journey. You know, you, you, you can make that that specific connection. Um, Percy Jackson, the reason why a lot of kids like Percy Jackson is because he struggled at school. He was a middle schooler who was flunking and he, he was diagnosed with a learning difference and all that. And if you can make that connection with how kids struggle, how, how, how school is hard, then th that helps too. And of course, go to bookstores and comic stores at all times. Um, when, when my kids were younger, and you can see that the picture there, that's my daughter when she was, uh, when she was in kindergarten or first grade. And she, um, after school we, we, uh, and during the weekends, we, we always head to Barnes & Noble. And um, that would be our hand. We'd hang out there for hour, two hours after school. I'd have my coffee. They would browse as many books as they can. And um, they loved it. They loved it. And uh, speaking of my daughter, my daughter is here right now. She and, uh, oh, this is Q&A. But before we go Q&A, um, my, my daughter is here. She's a high school junior. And um, she's, um, like I said, she's, a, she's an avid reader. She loves to read. Um, her um, reading comprehension, I think, is is you know something that I always admire because she always you know she usually scores highs in tests like this. So I decided to invite her and ask her for tips. And I, I'm sure you 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 guys might be thinking or might be asking about specific things about you know how you know what what can kids do. So um, let me uh, ask Maya. So Maya, what 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 helps you as a student? understand the text that you're reading um so i will say that when i was smaller my obviously my reading comprehension wasn't good so i think first and foremost you just need to read a lot like even if you don't get it at first or like if your child is like struggling with reading comprehension i'd say just encourage them to keep reading keep like um trying to like digest new texts and new information and it'll really help 
that's something that's like really helped me um because I remember when I was younger and I used to read like Harry Potter and these big books I would get like super frustrated because I had a hard time like understanding especially for like large chunks of text where it's like explaining the setting or like for example in The Hobbit I used to want to always read The Hobbit but I could never get through it because it was just so long so lengthy um but recently I read it and I was like oh it's such a nice book so it does take time and you do have to be really patient but I'd say for me the biggest thing is just to keep reading to keep trying even if you don't get it at first just push through and eventually hopefully it'll all work out after a while um at least that was from like in my case great great now what are the things that you know just just helped you build stamina or stay with the books and 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 keep on reading and and picking one book after the other um i mean as you like mentioned before finding books that really interested me otherwise like I wouldn't have been able to get through it if I wasn't interested in what happened so for example in like Harry Potter or like I was also into like Hunger Games I'm really into like action and adventure so even if I didn't like uh, get it like a hundred percent and I didn't know everything that was happening I was still able to follow along as especially because I was so interested in like the genre and the type of book. So I would say like stick to genres, stick to things that you like and you really want to read more about. And I think that's easiest for me because, for example, like I don't like nonfiction books. And if I tried to read a nonfiction book, it would take me like twice as long to really like understand it and like fully get all the information and like use my reading comprehension just because it's something that I'm not interested in. And I don't really want to like try and like understand it so yeah like keeping to what I liked to read is super helpful okay and last question and uh, Amber if you have any questions for her you, you feel free to ask um, you you mentioned about you know nonfiction about getting through texts what do you do if you have a, a reading comprehension test and m- most if not all of the texts are boring nonfiction <laughs> How do you get through them? And, and how do you answer like five or six questions afterwards? Um, that's a great question. I actually recently took my PSAT and that one has like really big like reading comprehension sections. Um, for me, like the texts are like they're super like long research like articles or like scientific things that sometimes I'm just reading and I'm like what is this like what is happening like how am I supposed to answer the questions but I think the biggest thing is if you don't understand the passage at first I just read it again and then like read it again and again um it's something that I have to keep keep reading. And then if I look at the questions, eventually things will start to come together. I'll like be like, oh, I did like remember seeing this somewhere because I've just like read it like five or six times. So even if I didn't fully understand that first, like by the sixth time, like I'm pretty sure that I've got like the basic information. So again, like just read it again and um, really try to keep up with it. Thank you. So don't give up. I think that's yeah. <laughs> that's it. in life and in reading. That's 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 great advice. Amber, do you have anything, or did you want to? <clears throat> Those are all great tips, Maya. Thank you. Um, it sounds like you're doing a really good job of trying to figure out through curiosity what um, it's staying curious. It's hard when it's not easy, and you're yeah. kind of like, I'm not very curious about this subject, but kind of engaging with something is like, I have to be curious because I need to actually figure out the answer to this. And so how do I maintain my curiosity when it's not something I want to be interested in? So um, that's a whole other skill set, isn't it? (laughs) So you're developing that, which is completely how we get through in uh, high school and college. So um, well done. (laughs) Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so thank you so much, Maya. And um, so now we can open it up for Q&A and uh, feel free to you ask uh, anything, any of us. Uh, you can ask Maya as well. Um, if anyone has any questions, um, you can just unmute yourself and ask, or you can ask through the chat. Hi, um, this is Angela. I have a question um, and I love your insight on it. So my son just started kindergarten at a Spanish immersion program. And I just was talking to my husband. I'm like, 
he needs to learn the Spanish, obviously, but obviously still learning how to read in English. So um, any advice on how to do this, like any advice, I'd appreciate it. <laughs> Sure. Um, first of all, the bilingual programs are, are really um, wonderful and they're mm -hmm. great, um, especially if you start them early. Um, you want to stick with one language base to get started um, instead of um, exposing language to two language bases. Which one is the school uh, prioritizing right now for instruction? Good question. So Spanish. Spanish is prioritized the first couple of years. And we were told that very often the kids will get behind in reading. Yeah. Um, so I guess prioritize the Spanish is what you're saying and probably what the school wants us to do. <laughs> yeah, I would stick with that. Um, there's always that worry that you have that you're going to be either loading up too much with um, trying to start English early and you can kind of get a sense from the student or the child if that is a little early, um, um, or you can just kind of keep going with uh, reinforcing the the singular language that the school's doing. Um, but eventually they're gonna start uh, working in uh, the second language as well. Um, but early literacy skills are gonna be necessary for both. So um, do okay. what you feel is best. Um, I would definitely read to the child. It doesn't matter what child, uh, what language you're reading to the child in. Um, okay. Make sure you're reading to the child a lot, though. That's advice for every every parent, really. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. So definitely focus on reading in both languages, and then yep. as far as the reading comprehension and all that, focus on Spanish. Yeah, I think, it, what language do you speak in at home, though? We mostly speak English, okay. um, although my husband is the Spanish speaker, not as good at reading Spanish, but he mm -hmm. speaks very well. You want to match the language um, linguistically that he's going to hear at home in terms of what you're you're speaking. So he can be working on the reading comprehension. Um, but in terms of what you're working on in, in language with speaking, you want to work on the vocabulary of the English too. It's really important actually. Yeah. Right. So it sounds like a bilingual um, is going to be approach is going to be necessary for that. Um, but the reading instruction should be just in Spanish through the school and then um, work on the vocabulary verbally um, I would say in English so that he can keep up with the conversations. Okay, that makes sense to me. Thanks for your advice. Sure. Um, I see there's a question in the chat. Any suggestion to boost kids' interest to read nonfiction books? Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I have some students that only want to read nonfiction, and so it can be the opposite problem too. Um, you know, there are all kinds of really, really good books to get uh, kids really interested in nonfiction. Um, and I would say National Geographic is one amazing source. Um, any magazine um, that is going to explore different natural uh, settings, any bugs, dinosaurs, anything like that um, can be really cool. And it's really about the home environment, making sure that that interest is kind of set, take them to the zoo, um, you know, making sure that they're getting their hands in the dirt from time to time and uh, um, letting them um, explore, um, giving them experiences in nature is really, really important. And then reading about it and um, any interest that shows up, um, you want to, you know, get a book in there and um, read some stories about the books, uh, about subjects that um, come through that. Um, if you're going to go somewhere, um, read about the nature you're going to go visit before you see it. Um, if uh, books are, you, you can always do audio books, you can do videos, you want to just kind of pump in the interest um, about anything that's there. Um, it's funny because fiction is um, sometimes what we think about in terms of reading, but um, the interests are often there for, for nonfiction, which is just about um, understanding where the interest is. So building the interest levels up can be just the key to figuring that out. So, Yeah, absolutely. My gateway into nonfiction was Sports Illustrated. When I was younger, I, was, I, I loved basketball. And once I read an issue about basketball, I was hooked. And, um, you know, that's, that's my introduction. And I still read 
uh, Sports Illustrated to this day. I go on ESPN. I, I read the articles there. Um, for Maya, for example, Maya is a ballerina. And uh, we gave her a book about ballet steps. And I think she liked that because um, you know, it, the book is still in our bookshelf and, and, and hopefully she still reads it. And the travel thing, that was, that's awesome. Uh, My, Maya loves travel. We give her all Rick Steves books um, before we are going, before we go to a, a specific um, destination. And she does good research and, and plans our, our itinerary. So she has a goal. And at the same time, she's reading nonfiction. So interest and goals, of course, a task um, w- would also help. Yeah, I think one thing that actually really strengthens reading comprehension is going and doing things in the world. <laughs> and um, that builds up all the lived experiences that they can pull from in terms of um, what the their backgrounds and, and the objects will look like. They can use the memory um, of what they've experienced. And that's what why I think a lot of older readers, teenagers, and adults have more enjoyment um, derived from reading because we can pull from our lived experiences into those visualizations, but um, with children don't have that yet. So before you go do things, uh, before you uh, go on a trip, but even at the store, talk about what you see, um, explain, describe, talk about the shapes of vegetables um, and use vocabulary and, and have them you know, tell you about it instead of just you telling them, have them talk about it to you and describe it to you because um, we're finding a lot of students um, need that language to be spoken out and that helps them to uh, um, build those verbal skills too. So it's a two-way street on that uh, listening and also speaking. So Okay. Well, thank you so much. This was fun. And and thank you so much, Maya, for, for taking the time out. I know you're a busy Maya? junior. Yeah. Um, and um, you were very gracious and um, very articulate as well. Um, thank you for sharing that. And um, thank you, everyone, for attending. Uh, we'll see you in our next webinar. And we hope you found this valuable. Thank you so much, Amber. Any last words? Keep reading. (laughs) Yes, keep reading, keep writing as well. Good night, everyone. Good night. Thank you for coming. Bye.